and this morning, I don't have a long message, um, <clears throat> but I've got a word from the Lord for us. Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we do thank you for the opportunity that we've got as a church to see this next gen, to see the, 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 the people being dedicated to you, Lord. We see children, but Lord, you see a mighty army. You see people that will influence and bring change to our nation and to our society in times to come. And we thank you because our eyes are seeing these things. And we pray this morning, Lord, as your word comes forth. I want to be like the sower with the seed in my hand. I pray that hearts be prepared and ready to receive the seed. Paul plants Apollos waters, but only you gives the increase. I pray you bring the increase to your word into our lives, into our families, into our situations in the name of Jesus and into our church. Thank you, Father, for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. i like to share on what I call change ahead. Change ahead. And, 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 and I, I was tweeting yesterday... And, and, and the hashtag was season of change. Um, for those of you who are not on Twitter, I hope you repent and get on Twitter. And somebody's wondering, what's he talking about? Don't even worry about it. Yes, yeah, season of change, season of change. And I feel in my spirit that we are in a season, a brand new season where God is bringing change into our church as a whole. But this morning, I'm not talking about what God wants to do in our church as a whole. I'm going to leave that to the coming weeks when Pastor Paul is going to share with us. But I want to talk about how God is bringing change into our lives as individuals. How important is change? I have a quote here from John F. Kennedy, an ex-president of the United States and he said, change is the law of life. And those who look only to the past or present are certain to miss the future. Change is the law of life. Everything around you is changing. Uh, you only need to look at the photographs you took 15 years ago. How trendy those clothes you were in are still. I bet they are not as trendy as you will wish them to be. One time we get our trousers to be a bit smaller, another time we get it to be a bit bigger. Then we realize we need to go back to being smaller again and then come back to being bigger again. So people just like changing, but I'm not talking about changing for changing sake. I'm talking about positive, good change. Uh, 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 I, I realize that whether you, you accept and embrace change or not, change will always happen. You find yourself as a single person, man or a woman, enjoying your free life. Then you get married and suddenly change is forced on you. And somebody wants to know where you are at, at every minute and second of the day. And, and it's like you're being monitored and you're like, did I get married to Interpol? No, not at all. It, it's just that your life has changed and you need to understand it. And people talk about midlife crisis. I give you the definition of midlife crisis. He's a man in his 40s trying to pretend he's 20. That is midlife crisis. He's not adapting and accepting change. I can tell that to you from experience. That when I hit 40, I still thought I was 20. I wanted to be less than 20. Then I realized, no, you've got to embrace the fact. I know some of you are shocked. We didn't even know he's 40. <laughs> <laughs> he renews my youth like an eagle, I tell you. God, God, God is bringing into our lives a season of change. And we've got to embrace it. If we don't embrace this change, then we're going to be left behind. What happens when you, when you go to the market and you go to the Apple store and you want to buy the, uh, 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 the iPhone, the original iPhone, and you say, I want the iPhone. And they say, no, we've got the iPhone 5 and the iPhone 6. And you say, no, I want the iPhone. They're going to tell you the iPhone is no longer in existence. You either have the iPhone 4S 
or the iPhone 5 or the iPhone 6. And, 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 and in, in a year's time, I believe there will be iPhone 10 because they're just, they're just bringing it out every day. And, and we, we, you, you realize that even when you don't want to change your phone, they stop sending updates to the phone that you have. And, and so your phone is not, is, not, is not functioning because you haven't changed it. You haven't changed it. That's not to say now you should tell your husband, I need an iPhone 6. That's not an excuse for iPhone 6. Uh, but, but it's just an example. You know, you could, you, could, you could make anything out of anything. It's just an example I'm giving, really. That, that change is happening all around us every day. Things are changing. People are changing. The society is changing. Things that were no longer ac that were not acceptable ten years ago are now acceptable today. That's a change for the worse. But we are talking about changing for the better, changing for the good. And I like to say something that the Christian life is a life of change. When you got saved, God changed you from the inside. The Bible says we were translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. So a change took place at new birth. You were changed. 2 Corinthians 5.17 If anyone be in Christ is a new person. All things have passed away. All things have become new. A change took place. And, and ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to let you know that when our walk on earth is over, a change takes place. The Bible says the, the voice of the trump will blast. And those of us who are alive will be cut up in the clouds. The dead in Christ will rise up first. The Bible says, and we shall be changed in the twinkling of an eye. So we get saved being changed. And at the end of the race on earth, we are changed. But in between salvation and when Jesus Christ comes, Comes, if he tarries, uh, uh, there is a whole lot of changes happening in our lives. And I call that transition. It's a transition process. Now, I give you a scripture in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. God was faced with a situation that needed change. And in verse 2, the Bible says, Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. God found himself in a situation where the earth was without form and void, unshaped and unformed, barren and empty, depressing and needy, undeveloped and unfinished, unfruitful and unproductive, uninhabited. It was empty. Some translation says empty. The Hebrew word is tohu bohu, empty and void. It had no shape. It had no form. And God says, no, we can't continue with this. This cannot be allowed to continue. We've got to change something here. Genesis chapter 1 is about change. It's about God coming in and saying, no, I can't let this continue. I've got to change it. Light has got to come in place of darkness. Life has got to come in place of death. I've got to get the waters away and let the, ground, the dry ground appear. God is a God of change. God likes things changing. God likes flipping things around, not for the worse, but for good. And all things go from chaos to destiny by transition. What is transition? I, I have a definition here. A process of change. It, it, and, and listen, it, it's a process. And, and God is processing us. When you go to a processing plant, there, there, there is the point where the raw materials are fed into a machine. And then there is a place where the finished product is. But in between the finished product and where the raw material is dipped into the machine, there is a process. And that's what we are going through. Pastor Paul said something this morning. Talk about we are work in progress. We are not a finished article yet. You are not a finished article yet. Even if you think you are good, you can be better. Even even if you think you're better, you can be the best. There's something about you that is not yet in place. God wants to make you better than you are now. God wants to bring the best out of you. And listen to me. When you read the book, when you read the Bible and you see the word perfection, in Greek it means katatismos. It's, it's not a state of being. It's a process leading onto maturity. Perfection in the scriptures, when it says be perfect as your father is perfect, it means undergo the process. Undergo that, that journey where God is changing and changing and changing and changing 
and changing. And you see, when you think you have arrived, you set yourself up for a fall. Because the Bible says the haughty spirit leads to a fall. It leads to destruction. Pride is thinking, I have arrived. Pride is thinking, I have it all made up. Then God comes to shake you up a little bit and makes you realize, uh, without me, you can do nothing. I'm the one pruning you so that you can bring forth more fruit. And as a church and as a people, if we look at ourselves and think this is where God wants us to be, God comes around and he shakes us a little bit. And he says, come on, you can be better than this. You can do more than this. There is still more ahead of you. He says, I will open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing there shall not be room enough to receive it I like that phrase room enough to receive it anything you have from God if you've still got room for it it means there's room for more <laughs> there's room for more and I like what pastor used to say he said the biggest room in this church is the room for improvement have that in your house as well. A room for improvement. Tell your husband, have we got a room for improvement in this house? I know we've got a three-bedroom house, but we need a four-bedroom house so that we can have one room for improvement. We can have a space in our lives, in our relationships, in, in, in the way we do things for improvement. I can be better than this. I always tell myself, I am not the best yet because God is still working on me. So if I step on your toes, I am so sorry. I am just a work in progress. I might have the title pastor to my name, but I'm still a work in progress. I don't have it all made up yet. Please have mercy on me so God can have mercy on you as well. I'd like to tell you about the man named Jabez. In the book of First Chronicles chapter 4, 9 and 10, faced with a situation that needed changing. Jabez was more honorable than his brothers. His mother had named him Jabez, saying, I gave birth to him in pain. Imagine giving birth to a child and naming the child pain. And he goes to school and they call him pain. How are you? I'm fine. And he goes to the shopping mall. Pain, how are you? Oh, I'm doing okay. And he goes to, to find a job. And they say, what is your name? First name, pain. He's, he's living in pain. That enough is torture. And his name was Jabez. But the Bible says he was more honorable than his brethren. He did something the others didn't do. He realized that my situation, I may not be able to do anything about the past. I may not be able to do anything about the present. But I can change my future. I'm speaking to somebody here. I can change my future. I can change my future. I may not be able to, to change my family lineage. I, I may not be able to change my history. I may not be able to change the genetic makeup in my physical body. But there is a God in heaven who says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new person. All things are passed away. It's not what you do about the past. It's about what you do about the now and the future that really matters. The Bible says, Jabez cried out to God of Israel, oh, that you will bless me and enlarge my territory. I may have been called pain, but I've got a future. I've got a hope. I've got a destiny. I've got a promise. And I keep my eyes on the goal. I refuse to look backward. I refuse to think about history. I refuse to dig and dig and dig and dig and dig. And you know, some people like digging. They dig about the causes of the past. They dig about the causes of their great, 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 great great, 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 great grandparents. It matters what you're focusing on. I'm focusing on the future. I'm focusing on what God has in store for me. He says, uh, uh, Christ has redeemed me from the cause of the law. Be made a cause for me that the blessing of Abraham might come upon my life. Listen, even if you were born in a family that is laden with curses, when you come to Christ, that curse is gone and the blessing is here. You can receive it, you can claim it, you can, you can lay hold on it. You can lay hold on it. Your past should not, be, should not be the reason why you cannot actualize your future. Your past is not strong enough to deny what God wants to do in your life. You only need to look at the scriptures. People that came from unworthy background. People that came from, they even said about Jesus, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? But he is the king of kings today. He is the lord of lords today. That man from Galilee. Praise the Lord. 
I'm ready for change. Say with me, I'm ready for change. Bring it on, Lord. I'm ready for change. I'm ready for change. In the way I read my Bible, I'm ready for change. In the way I pray, I'm ready for change. In the way I come to church, I'm ready for change. You've been in church for four years. You haven't served in any department. Come on, it's time to change. It's time to say, Lord, I put my hands on the plow. I'm ready to serve. Quit saying I can't do it. Quit saying I'm not qualified. God qualifies you when you're willing to do something. He's not looking looking for ability. He's looking for willingness. If you say, here am I, Lord, he will use you, irrespective of who you are. I don't have anything in myself. I don't have anything to boast in. I am so reserved. I used to be so shy. I couldn't talk to anyone, but today, he's given me the boldness and I will speak because he gave it to me. You can do much more than you think you can. All you need to do is tell yourself, I can do it. I'm ready for change. It's time to embrace it. It's time to embrace it. It's time to embrace it. Quit letting people talk you down. Quit let, letting people uh, say you are not worth much. Tell them, I am worth something in the eyes of the Heavenly Father. Embrace change. To who, but who. But God said, let there be light. And there was light. And at the end of Genesis chapter 1, the Bible says, God saw that everything he changed was good. You're going to look back this year. The year of gold for bronze. Listen, this is June. June is finishing. God said it's, it's gold for bronze. How many of us have the gold for bronze yet? If you don't have the gold for bronze, don't pretend. It's time to sit up and say, God, 2015 cannot pass me by and I don't have my gold for bronze. Number one, four things you can do to activate this change. Don't limit the streams of impute in your life. Do not limit the streams of input in your life. It, 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 dead things don't need, don't need to grow. They don't talk about growing. They, they decay. But living things grow. And one of the forces behind growth is change. When you see something that is alive, it's changing because it's growing. Where there is no life, there is no growth. Where there's no growth is because there's no change. And many times when you feel you don't need to change, you need to check it out. You are alive. Last Sunday, we, we, we talked about our source, God being our source. And, and, and you see, if you're not connected to the source, you don't realize you need to change. If your fellowship with God is not alive, you don't think you need to change. But every single time you spend time with the Lord, every single time you're on your knees praying, every single time you open the Bible to read and to study, every single time you come to church, something tells you you need to change. You need to change that habit. You need to change the way you say that. You need to change that attitude to that. You need to stop hating that person. You need to stop being stingy. You need to do this. You need to do that. It's change. God likes change because it's full of life. Everywhere you see God, there's life, there's change, there's growth, there's there's development, there's progress. Promotion does not come from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south. It comes from God. It comes from God. And when we are not ready to change, God can take us to the next level. It's, it's all about change. Listen to me. God said to Joseph, oh, I, I, you, you're going to be exalted up there. But when the time came, when the time came and Pharaoh sent for Joseph from the prison, one thing Joseph did, he changed his garment. He said, no, I'm ready now for throne. I'm ready now for kingship. I'm ready now for authority. The Bible says he changed his garment. You can't take the prison cloth into the throne room. You will be sent out. Some of us are not ready to change. I am ready to change, Lord. I am ready to change, Lord. I am ready to change, Lord. Oh, Shalianda. Proverbs chapter 1 verse 7. It says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. Listen, when God comes to you and is tough on you. And God is hard on you. And the things God is saying is hard on your flesh. It's hard on your mind. He has something in mind. Wisdom. Number two, determine what you don't want to repeat. Insanity is doing the same thing over and over and again expecting a different outcome it never works that way if you're going to have a different outcome you got to change what you're doing determine what you don't want to repeat determine what you don't want to repeat determine what you don't want to repeat 
if my grandfather was beating his wife and my father was beating his wife, I can repeat that if I'm not careful. And suddenly I, I draw inspiration from my great-grandparents. But I've got to change that. I've got to say, no, that's in the physical gene. But I've been changed. I've been transformed. I'm not the same person. It says, being born of the spirit, not of the flesh. Being born of the spirit, whatsoever is born of God. You've got the, the life of God within you. Stop, stop behaving like you were the same with your earthly parents. Stop behaving as if you are the same with your earthly lineage. You are born of God. You've got a different life within you. But until you take instruction and draw from the source and receive from the Father, you don't know the way to go. You don't know how to go. You don't know what to do. But as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. And you can be the shining light in your family. And you can be the shining light in your generation. And you can be different from every other person. And they look at you and they say, is this not the son of so and so? Why is he doing this? He is so different. Because, listen to me, when God has his hand upon you, you shine like the star in the sky. Lamentations chapter 3 verse 40. It says, let us examine our ways and test them. And let us return to the Lord. Sometimes you need to do a soul searching. Not soul searching to find fault. Not soul searching to beat yourself. Not soul searching to tell yourself I'm useless, worthless. Soul searching to see what do I need to change in my life. Every time I'm faced with a crisis, I ask myself what do I need to change. If all my friends suddenly are leaving me, I need to ask myself am I loving enough? Am I kind enough? Am I friendly enough? The Bible says in the book of Proverbs, he that will have friend has to ha show himself friendly. If you don't show yourself friendly, you don't have friends. People People don't like somebody who is saucy. People don't like somebody who is always full of himself or herself. People don't like that. But nobody is bold to tell you because you are too full of her like a tiger. If they ever tell you the truth, you are going to bite them and chew them off. But listen to me. God is not scared of you. Shout hallelujah somebody. Shout hallelujah somebody. God will tell you the way it is. God will tell you the way it is. And when that change is effected, his blessings pour out. I like this statement. It's on my slide. It's not what happens to you in life that determines your future. It is how you respond to what happens that determines your future. How do you respond to it? How do you respond to it? Number three, target specific areas. For positive change. When we talk about change, suddenly people go home and they want to make wholesale changes to their lives. And, 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 and they end up messing the whole thing up. And they say, it doesn't work. Listen, you got to look at, you got to start from somewhere. You, line by line. Line by line. That's how you got to do it. You got to say, Lord, help me. And God will shine light one, one at a time. You, listen, listen, if a new manager comes into a new football club and decides to change the whole team, he's only setting himself up for failure. But what you do as a good manager, you come to a team that is relegation bound and you look at one place that you need to sort out. You do it one at a time. One at a time. You look at your life and you say, God help me. What do I need to change? Is it in relationship? I need to build relationship. I don't have good relationship with my neighbors. I don't have good relationship with my work colleagues. I need to build on that. You take that and every day you say, God help me. In Philippians chapter 3 verse 12, he said, not that I have already obtained all these or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took a hold of me. Your thoughts, your thoughts create your reality. And what you look at longest becomes your strongest in your life. If you keep looking at the wrong thing in your life, it, 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 it's, it's just going to build a, a, a fortress in you. If you keep looking at your pain, if you keep looking at your defeat, if you keep cal calculating all the, all the places you've gone wrong, if you keep letting the enemy cheat you out of your blessing, then you, that's going to be a stronghold in your life. But if you begin to look at it, it, where, where love is needed, you begin to focus your energy on loving people or where you need patience. You begin to focus your energy on 
from being patient. I, I, I remember coming into marriage. I, I, you know, many times, many of us get married, and we don't really, we go through the, we go through the counseling classes, but while that's going on, you're just shaking your head. You're not really receiving anything. You're, all you're thinking about is the wedding. All you're thinking, and your counselor is telling you, do you understand that? You need to be patient. Yeah, 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 yeah. I get that. I get that. Lesson seven, completed. Wedding. Then you get married and realize, ooh, 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 you need a lot of patience. And some of us, instead of working on it, we throw the pram, we throw everything out of the pram, we throw all the toys out, you, you just throw everything out. Yeah. Get, them, get them back in the pram, get everything back, get, get them back, get them back, arrange them well. And understand that it's not all the other person's fault. It's not all the other person's fault. You've got something as well that you need to change. Jesus said if you look at other people and you can see the, the speck in, in, in their eyes. You've got a big huge log right in front of you. You're not doing anything about it. And you realize Jesus is saying the change doesn't start from outside. It starts from inside. If you change, something will change with the other person. And finally, this morning, I like to say, when you wake up in the morning, number four, how to embrace change. You wake up, smile, and tell yourself, today woo, is my day. Anybody wants to say that with me? Today is my day. Now, don't get nervous by the person next to you. Say it with boldness. Today is my day. You listen, listen. Don't just say it today. Tomorrow, Monday, you say it to yourself. Tuesday, you say it to yourself. You go with a positive attitude. Listen to me. People are afraid of change because it's not their habit to change. When we go into change territory, we get nervous because it's not our territory. We're not used to changing things by ourselves. We're used to change happening that we didn't orchestrate by ourselves. And so when God leads us to begin to change things by our ourselves, we start getting nervous because we're not used to it. And we expect things to go wrong. Just because you change things doesn't mean it will go wrong. Give it a try. If it doesn't work, try it another way. There's a thousand and one ways to make things work. Today is my day. Jeremiah 29 verse 11. I like the way the living Bible puts it. He says, I know the thoughts and the plans that I have for you. Thoughts of good and not of evil. To give you hope in the final outcome of your life. Hope is, a, is the healthy expectation of that which is good. Hope has to do with positivity. You're going to leave home in the morning with hope. You're going to go back home with hope. You're going to look towards the future with hope. You've got to look at your life with hope. We've got to look as a church to this nation with hope. We've got to look at what God is doing in the church with hope. A healthy expectation that God is in charge. He says, I know the plans that I have for you. Many times I used to think, God, if I didn't do this, that wouldn't have happened. Then I realized, no, it's God that orchestrated it in the first place. He puts it in my heart to do it, and I did it so that what he has in mind can come to pass. Already he is the master strategist. He said to, to Joseph, I'm going to put you to the top. And, and in, 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 when you read the Genesis account, it says Joseph went to the pit. It says Joseph went to the prison. He went to Potiphar's house, then to the prison. But if you read in Psalms, in the Psalms account, Psalm 105, I hope I'm right on this. It says God sent a man before them, even Joseph. How did... how? Genesis didn't say God sent a man. Genesis said they were sold as a slave. But the Bible says, no, it was God sending him. God sent him as a missionary. God sent him as a lifesaver. What you are going through, you are on divine assignment. It may look difficult. It may look tough. But you are on divine assignment. The mission will be made clear in the fullness of time. Because God is going to make you the head and not the tail. You're going to be above and not below. Whatever you lay your hands to do eventually it will prosper. You will have a song in the night season. Anybody listening to me? Come on. Come on, receive that. Receive that. 
I will have a song in the night season. I will have a song. It's turning my mourning into dancing. It's turning my pain into rejoicing. And it's time to just embrace that. Joy. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Father, we thank you this morning. Oh, we just bless your name. Anybody wants to pray with me, just, just pray in whatever language you want. Just, just, just pray. Just pray.